Okay, recapping from some of the earlier presentations that maybe you've seen, uh, there's lots of different ways of doing evaluation, lots of different types of evaluation, lots of ways of categorizing them. And this slide just shows a simple way of uh, categorizing different types of evaluation. Uh, some evaluations, for example, look at uh, the issue of feasibility, that is, how an intervention is being delivered. Is it plausible? Is it salient? Is it acceptable, appropriate, deliverable? Does it reach the target population? Some evaluations focus on impacts. Is it effective? What are the outcomes? What are the impacts? What are the broader impacts? Are there any unintended consequences? Some evaluations try to do everything. They try to aim at a broader understanding of what's going on, particularly with a more complex intervention. So here, you might be looking at the influence of both macro and micro contexts, not only as potential confounders, but also as things that influence the intervention as it's rolled out in different places in different ways. You might be interested, you probably will be interested in the theory of change and the mechanisms that make an intervention work or not work. You're interested in delivery processes and outputs, and you're thinking a lot about how the findings might be transferable. And as I've said before, some kinds of evaluation are formative, that is, they're intended to design that particular intervention that's taking place. Uh, so often you, you deliver your findings or interim findings while the intervention is taking place in the hope that you'll then influence and improve it. Uh, and sometimes you have summative evaluations, often outcome evaluations, that are designed to uh, deliver their findings at the end of the intervention um, to influence future planning and future interventions. So as I said, this presentation is about evaluation on a budget. Uh, and the first kind of evaluation we're going to discuss is kind of feasibility evaluations. Uh, and I'm going to give an example. I'm going to give you an example of a very low cost evaluation I worked on that focused on whether a particular intervention was feasible. The intervention was a national government target to get 13.5% of Scotland's overweight children to complete a family-centred health weight, healthy weight behavioural change intervention. Uh, and that target of getting 13.5% of overweight children had to be achieved over a three-year period. Now, the exact way this intervention was going to be rolled out was going to differ by area. Uh, nine months into the intervention, we conducted, or myself and colleagues conducted, a formative process evaluation. We looked at how delivery was going to uh, occur across the different areas of Scotland. Uh, at this early stage, we were looking at how different local areas were uh, attempting to roll out this intervention. Specifically, we asked, at this nine month uh, from the start period, we asked, what are boards doing? What are the health boards doing in terms of delivering this intervention? Are the interventions they're delivering feasible? Is the overall target, the 13.5% target, feasible? Will it affect prevalence of overweight children in Scotland? And as I say, we wanted this nine-month interim evaluation to be formative, but we had very few resources to carry out the evaluation. Here's what we had to work with to do our evaluation. We had an afternoon workshop. We had funding for an afternoon workshop where local deliverers talk through the interventions that they're delivering in their area and talk through any challenges they're experiencing. The rest of it was really desk-based, actually. Uh, we had a literature review where we looked at similar interventions to try and gauge what uh, what kind of level of effectiveness we should expect and what kind of barriers and facilitators we might find. We also did telephone interviews, uh, semi-structured interviews, with a handful of people who were in charge of delivering the interventions in their local areas. And we asked them about identification. How did they, identif how, how did they begin to identify um, young people who were considered overweight? How did they recruit them into their um, behavioural change courses? what was on those courses, what was the programme content, what were they actually delivering to these uh, young people. And we also asked people whether they themselves in their local areas were monitoring or, or evaluating or collecting data on how their efforts were going to deliver this intervention. We asked people what needs to happen for this intervention to work and what could potentially go wrong, what was, if anything, going wrong. Okay, this slide uh, 
shows a simple, very simple theory of change that we developed to help us organise our thoughts around this intervention and this evaluation. We came up with a few stages that were necessary for the intervention to have any possible impact. Stage number one is identification. In order for this intervention to work, there needed to be a way to, to identify a substantial number of children, young people in Scotland, who met the government definition of being overweight. The next stage is recruitment. Once you've identified uh, young people who meet the criteria of being overweight, you have to persuade them to join the intervention, to take part in the course, the behavioural change course. And you also, for these interventions, have to persuade their parents. Assuming you do persuade people to take part in the courses, then, hopefully, these people will complete them. They won't drop out midway through. Finally, and not even included on this slide yet, there's the issue of what happens to people who complete the course. Does it successfully change their behaviour? Well, we were doing interim results, so we focused on the early stages of the chain with this evaluation. What we found from talking to the people who were delivering this intervention in its different areas, that all those points in the early part of the, st of the theory of change were causing them problems. We found, for example, that there was no systematic way of identifying the weight of children in Scotland. At least not all children in a three-year period. Instead, what they had was um, school height and weight checks that only occurred once or twice during the school career of any particular student. So it wouldn't be enough to identify all the overweight children in Scotland. At most, possibly, they might be able to identify about 25% young people who were considered overweight. Those local areas that had gone some way into delivering this intervention were telling us they were having big problems actually recruiting even the people they managed to identify as being overweight. People didn't want to take part in this intervention, and sometimes their parents didn't either. And in fact, the figures we got estimated about 1 in 20 of people approached to take part in the intervention would actually say yes. We also found there were further dropouts in ter uh, during the intervention itself, so not everybody completed. We did some maths, some simple maths, around these uh, estimated figures we got early on, and they basically told us that the percentage of people being covered by this intervention was dropping rapidly in its early stages of its theory of change. Uh, only 25% of people who were considered overweight and who met the criteria for this intervention were identified. An estimated 1.25% of uh, all overweight 5 to 15 year olds in Scotland were likely to be recruited and maybe only 0.75% were actually going to complete these interventions. Now these were real estimates um, in the sense that they, they were um, they weren't precise, they weren't measured in any way, they were just early estimates based on what practitioners have told us. But it's striking that the, the end figure is 0.75% compared to the actual target figure that the government wanted, which was 13.5%. If these estimates, even if they're not particularly precise, so long as they're in the right ballpark, they're completely missing the mark for achieving the target. So our early estimates were 0.75% of overweight young people completing these interventions instead of the 13.5 that the government wanted. And that's before we even consider how many people will actually benefit and improve their health as a result of the intervention. And here we just looked at the literature because it was too early to actually see how the interventions themselves were going. So we looked at the literature and we found that the kind of interventions that were being delivered, there was some evidence of effectiveness, but it tended to be fairly moderate effectiveness. In other words, uh, relatively small numbers of people who take part in the intervention do indeed benefit from it, but usually not in any huge way. So, not only was the intervention missing its target according to our early estimates, but uh, once you factored in how many of those would actually benefit from it, the effect it was likely to have on Scottish childhood obesity was going to be minimal. This suggests a need to abandon or reduce the target of 13.5 or refocus efforts on something else. Possibly improving identification and recruitment of overweight children, working out how to make the first part of that theory of change work better.
or maybe switching to less targeted interventions if identifying overweight children is a main source of difficulty or one of the main sources of difficulty uh, perhaps what you need is a different kind of intervention one that affects a whole class a whole school a whole town maybe something that deals with a problem at source by affecting food supply and at this point when you start looking for alternative interventions because the one you've got isn't working it's time to go back to the literature and really try and get a sense of what works so was this a good evaluation? Well, in many senses, it wasn't. There was no final outcome. It was based on very rough estimates given by people, some of which, some of which was anecdotal and some of which was based on only very early monitoring of interventions being delivered. And it tells us about barriers to intervention delivery, but it doesn't really tell us about the solutions. From that, we need to go back to the literature or just start testing out new interventions, new things. But on the other hand, I'd like to argue that even though it's not a classically great intervention evaluation, the study design is definitely not what people would normally consider to be robust. Uh, it was an appropriate evaluation for this particular stage of the intervention. It did indeed provide a good early warning uh, that the intervention was not happening, was not being delivered as planned, that something was wrong with it. Uh, it gave an opportunity to look for a solution to these early problems, or to stop the intervention and try something else. The findings were extremely imprecise, let's not be, let's not be fooled by that. I mean, they were based on very rough estimates, but they were also very striking. And my point is here, what good would have extra precision have done? The findings that we had, I would argue, were strong enough to make us really doubt whether this particular intervention could possibly get anywhere near the target. And whether it was 5 or 5% 5 out, it was still going to miss the target. And the evaluation was cheap. We had limited resources and we did what we could with it. Okay, next we're going to look at evaluations that consider impacts. Okay, so we're focusing on impact evaluations now. Impact evaluations often measure change quantitatively. Quantitative data can be expensive to get hold of, can be expensive to work with, but not always, sometimes routinely available a quantitative data for the outcomes you're interested in might, fortunately for you, be available. You can work with them for, for relatively low cost. Okay, so there are different kinds of study designs that we're going to consider for impact evaluations. Some have no separate comparison group or control group. They might be before and after designs or interrupted time series. And others do indeed have separate comparison or control groups and there's different kinds of, of, of uh, study designs that fit that description as well such as uh, non-equivalent comparison groups and difference in difference analysis experiments and randomized controlled trials I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on all of these types of study designs just give you a brief introduction to some of the issues involved so the first one we'll consider is a very simplest kind of study design uh, a pre and post with no comparison group a before and after study this is often a very cheap kind of study to produce because you don't have the expense of collecting data from other areas uh, and it's very simple but it's also a very weak study design if you're just measuring the people who've received the intervention before and after they've got it what you don't know is whether there's anything else out there that could possibly be affecting them and changing the outcome that you're interested in and let's face it lots of things are going on over time change happens over time and without uh, a better counterfactual than that without a better comparison group you're not knowing what changes are caused by the, inter by the intervention and what changes are caused by confounders. The next kind of study design we're going to consider is the interrupted time series. In some ways quite similar to a pre and post design. The main difference is instead of just having say one measure before the intervention and one or one or two measures after the intervention of interrupted time series uses lots of measures beforehand and lots of measures afters typically obtained because people have collected data routinely possibly every year possibly every month depends on the data source um, what an interrupted time series allows you to do is to look at trends before the, the intervention happened and trends afterwards and this is a key distinction from a simple pre and post study looking at trends allows you to get a sense of what was happening what kind of changes were underway on the outcome of interest even before the intervention occurred it allows you to see whether the intervention changed the trend this 
greatly strengthens what you can deduce about whether the intervention itself had an impact on adding to or, or, or reducing the level of changes that were already taking place. So an interrupted time series can be a stronger design, a much stronger design than uh, a pre and post study. Also, interrupted time series can sometimes have uh, separate control areas which also have their own interrupted time series. So you can do a lot with them and it's, this is an area of research that's uh, growing at the moment. Now we're going to consider evaluations that do use a control or comparison area or comparison group to help you deal with the issue of confounding. Now not everybody agrees with it but there is a substantial number of people within the evaluation field who think that uh, having a good control or comparison area uh, or comparison group is essential if you want to claim that what you have is a robust evaluation that's able to create any sort of evidence that uh, could support the case for the intervention is indeed uh, creating changes in your population in the outcome of interest. But getting comparison areas can be difficult and can sometimes be expensive. It depends of course on the size of the evaluation, the size of the population, but if you are talking about large area level interventions of a kind that public health researchers often evaluate, then it becomes really tricky. It becomes tricky to find different populations that are very, very similar to your intervention group or to your intervention area. So here are some options and these are listed broadly uh, in order of a, a, a kind of a, a wish list that people sometimes have. So at the top of the wish list is being able to come up with a comparison area by randomly allocating the intervention to either uh, an intervention group or a control group. And this can be done uh, in, for individuals or for groups of individuals, for clusters. If you can't randomly allocate your intervention, then perhaps you can match your intervention group to a control group based on a, a set number of criteria that you've decided are important for your evaluation. And if you can't actually match using a set number of criteria, perhaps you just have to settle for a more pragmatic uh, matching where you just find an area which for one reason or another you believe to be broadly similar to the, to the group that you're, to the population that you're evaluating. And the green arrow to the side of that, uh, to those bullet points, uh, gives you an idea of why people tend to see random allocation as the, uh, the most preferable form of, uh, of finding a comparison group or a comparison area. And basically, if you randomly allocate, the argument is that what you're doing is you're um, not only matching your intervention and control group on a few known characteristics, but you're also matching them on all characteristics, even the unknowns. Whereas if you're simply matching people on the basis of finding uh, uh, a group which has a small number of characteristics that are similar to your intervention group, then you're only matching on those known measurable characteristics. The final type of evaluation I want to discuss is evaluations that attempt a much broader understanding of the impacts and the processes involved with the intervention. And I have bad news for you on this one. If you're working with a budget, this is particularly the kind of evaluation that you're going to struggle to do. Um, you're going to have to be very skillful and very lucky in the sense of finding routine data that's freely available that can help you with your outcomes and being very judicious about how you deploy, let's say, some of your qualitative uh, field work. But on the whole, the message is that as you move from feasibility to impacts to a uh, more fuller understanding of the, of the intervention, then you're going to find that generally the cost of your evaluation goes up. So you often want to conduct these much broader, more ambitious evaluations when you're dealing with uh, quite complex interventions, because you want to know exactly how, it's difficult enough to know how they're being delivered, what the interventions actually are, and are likely to have a whole range of predictable and unpredictable impacts around uh, a much broader system. In short, these tend to be uh, uh, quite messy and quite complex evaluations. They might vary by location and they might change as they're delivered over time. They may have multiple outcomes and different pathways to different impacts.
And again, I can use urban regeneration as one example of these big, messy, multiple pathway, multiple impact interventions. Another one might be changes to the local food or alcohol environments. Understanding how these interventions impact upon the system, including impacts on the public, could require a lot of work, a lot of resource, and a whole mixture of methods which you might then have to try and triangulate or put together in one way or another. They might well be multi-site, they could even be long-term, a, a lot of regeneration interventions can take decades to complete. And they require a good understanding of the intervention, the context, the delivery and the theory around how they all interact. And here I'm going to give you an example of uh, the Go Well program, which is an uh, uh, urban regeneration study that I've worked on in the past. And it's uh, about the city of Glasgow undergoing a massive regeneration uh, and investment and improvements in neighbourhoods, in houses, uh, in community amenities of various kind, and in people's uh, democratic structures to influence housing decisions. So as you can see, it's a hugely complex intervention that affects different parts of Glasgow in different ways. And we've captured it by both doing multiple surveys, looking at routine data, um, doing lots of qualitative research with both deliverers and residents. Uh, and then we've had to try and find ways to put all that research together. It's expensive. So we've moved from feasibility studies to impact evaluations to much more ambitious complex evaluations of complex interventions. And I guess the good news is some of this research can be done on a tight budget, but as you move along that chain to the more complex evaluations, then the chances of you being able to do it cheaply become more remote. And you need to bear that in mind and decide what you can do, what you can realistically achieve with the resources that you have. So here are some key points summarizing what we just talked about. First of all, I suggest that the evaluation should be appropriate and sufficient and which in some cases can actually mean small and simple. Sometimes it is best and wisest to do something small and simple at the start just to see whether the intervention stands even a chance of plausibly working. Striking findings or large effects can reduce the need for greater precision and that can help reduce costs sometimes. However, if the intervention you're looking at is likely to produce more moderate effects, then you do need greater precision and this could ramp up the cost of your evaluation as it needs to become in effect more robust to um, measure that precision. Your job becomes harder if you think you have to identify small multi-outcome and time-delayed impacts. And the choice is not either experimental or theory of change style evaluations. You can do both if you have a good reason to. So the main message I want you to take home with you from this presentation is a small, cheap evaluation can be possible and sometimes it might even be the most appropriate. But there are also times where you have to cut your losses and decide that there are certain things you cannot evaluate if you don't have the right resources to do it. Thanks for listening.